Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to VG Myths, the online internet video game TV show finally airing its season 3 finale turned season 4 opener turned random episode number with no special significance whatsoever. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate's World of Light is a massive single-player campaign in Nintendo's flagship crossover fighting series which takes the crossover to the ultimate, with hundreds of collectible video game characters functioning as your equipment and determining how much you suck. So, of course, I had no choice but to take the sucking to the max. Can you complete Super Smash Bros. Ultimate's World of Light without spirits or skills? Keyword, complete. Beating the game spiritsless would be impressive, but any percent is nowhere near painful enough. This mission will only be considered complete if we manage to beat all 618 battles in the World of Light on hard mode without ever equipping a spirit or skill. There is also one extra rule. DLC fighters are allowed, with one specific exception. We're not allowed to use any of Hero's one-hit KO moves for obvious reasons. With the rules set, let's get this 100-plus hour journey started! Battle number one, Smoky Prog. Without spirits, we're at a major disadvantage. All damage calculations are run through a math problem using our own spirit's power and our opponent's power. There is, however, one equipment option we have available to us, the currently selected player character. We start out with just Kirby, and every non-DLC fighter is located in a preset location somewhere on the map and will be recruited upon defeat. Keep in mind where every character is located and prioritize the characters you're best with. Though I understand you might be terrified by the apparent requirement of being good at video games. Never fear, while being good at video games is a valid strategy, it's also a terrible, obsolete, and optional one. Say hello to the true dominant strategy, Unforgivable Cheese. Battle number 18, Jury. Kirby is the starter character, and he just so happens to have one of the most broken move types in the game. Final Cutter ends with a downward slash that carries any opponent's hit with it to the floor. If used at just the right positioning, Kirby will send his opponent hurtling below the stage, but save himself by catching the ledge. While Jury is normally a difficult spirit, this cheese allows you to obliterate her effort-free. Unfortunately, as awesome as this looks, it's not the cheese to end all cheese. Battle number 10, Fiora. Kirby's cheese will only be reliably useful against characters with terrible recovery, for example, Lucina and Shulk. Here, we got extremely lucky with the cheese followed by a footstool, leaving both characters just barely incapable of recovering. Battle number 26, Valu. If a character has good recovery, the cheese might accidentally work after 100 retries, but I instead recommend getting creative. Or, more accurately, as uncreative as possible. Battle number 22, Lucario. Say hello to the Spiritsless Run's unofficial mascot. You'll probably have to beat him legit, but once you do, he'll be a reliable option for almost every spirit battle in the entire game. Lucario's unique character gimmick is called Aura, giving him a proportional power boost based on his current damage percentage. At 0% damage, he's one of the weakest members of the cast, but at the maximum 190%, he's 10 powerhouses duct taped together, rivaling the heaviest characters in the game while still retaining his relative agility. The worse you are at video games, the better a character Lucario becomes. In the hands of an absolute loser, he's capable of closing the spirit gap and letting us win a huge chunk of the early game battles before we get our hands on more reliable cheese. Battle number 29, Boom Boom. Unfortunately, some battles absolutely require cheese with absolutely no wiggle room. Boom Boom has the benefit of super armor, meaning he won't be launched or even stagger until high percentages. I attempted this a few dozen times until I eventually stumbled on the winning strategy totally by accident. Wait for Boom Boom to flub his controller inputs and self-destruct. I would joke about the AI being bad, but let's be honest, the AI probably does this less than you do. Battle number 34, Ho-Oh. This is the first legend battle we managed to beat, and by sheer luck we somehow managed to do it first try. Curry makes the Kirby cheese much more difficult to pull off, but somehow the RNG gods graced us with a golden opportunity footstool. Battle number 35, Twin Bellows. When going for Kirby's cheese, you don't necessarily have to grab the ledge. The battle is officially won at the exact moment your opponent is defeated, no matter how few microseconds you have left on this mortal coil. Battle number 37, Grudon. This battle served as an important reminder never to get too caught up in one strategy. After about half an hour of trying to cheese with Kirby, I tried experimenting with Link using casual strats and ended up winning in just a handful of attempts. Battle number 41, Giga Bowser. 
This is one of the easiest boss battles in the game, and not coincidentally, also the first we encounter. Unfortunately, even the easy bosses are a ridiculous endurance challenge. Since our power level is so low, our attacks only deal chip damage. Meanwhile, we die in two to three hits. Luckily, Lucario is perfect for boss battles. He's agile enough to dodge most attacks, and luckily just so happens to have a long-range neutral special. The only attack difficult to dodge is Bowser's Fire Breath, which ever so luckily does not launch us, and thus charges up aura for free. With full aura, you'll be dealing pathetic damage instead of just insignificant, making this endurance challenge just slightly shorter. Battle number 42, Snorlax. The gimmick here is that Snorlax just stands in place doing literally nothing, but has tons of health and must be KO'd in a limited time. I actually attempted this one a while before Giga Bowser with a variety of cheeses, but Snorlax was too stubborn and always pushed its way back on stage. After beating Giga Bowser, we unlocked Vanilla Bowser, who has his own highly situational brand of cheese. His side B grabs the opponent regardless of size and brings both of you hurtling to the ground. This move is automatically cancelled on contact with water, letting you repeat it over and over to drag Snorlax past the edge of the stage. Battle number 45, Esna. The extra distance gained from the grab makes Bowser's cheese exceptional at walk-off stages, usually completable in just a couple attempts. Battle number 47, Cap'n. Say hello to the absolute worst possible spirit attribute, Heavy Wind. Your opponents are never affected by the wind, but you get blown around like a plastic bag in a tornado factory. Even the speedy characters are only barely capable of fighting the wind in midair, and a small launch will send your character tumbling off screen while incapable of receiving input. My go-to pick here is Lucario. His recovery move is capable of moving in any direction, can fight the wind, and most importantly, gains distance proportionally with aura. As soon as the battle begins, boost yourself to the right island. This island leaves you more room to survive if launched in either direction, since the wind will actually protect you if launched to the right. The wind is also incapable of pushing you off a ledge while facing away from it. Camp up here and try to deal as much damage to Cap'n as you can. He'll charge up your aura pretty early, so even if you get launched left, you'll have a good enough chance of making the trip back. After an hour or so of attempts, I finally managed to bank high damage on Cap'n and show him what it really means to get blown. Battle number 59, Brittany. No, no, don't grab the, don't grab the Victory! friggin' ledge. I did it! <laughs> Battle number 65, Rain. Do it. Do it. Do it. You idiot! Battle number 116, Metal Gear Ray. Not only is Ray giant and made of metal, this is also a stamina battle, meaning they won't ever be launched any further as they take damage. Focus entirely on breaking the stage's outer wall, then Bowser cheese Ray past the edge of the screen. Battle number 117, Polar Bear. Once again, this is a stamina battle, this time on a battlefield stage. Polar Bear tends to approach very slowly, so I tried an endurance strategy using ranged attacks. Turns out this strategy was terrible, but that didn't matter. All luck, no skill. Battle number 135, Inkling. While not a game-breaking character, a mocking Inkling marks an important milestone in my own playthrough. Inkling is my second main in casual play, meaning whenever I want to pretend to be good at video games, I finally have a decent option. Battle number 136, Cap'n Wild World. Clearly, Cap'n is canonically the most powerful being in Animal Crossing lore, because both his spirit battles are ridiculously difficult. The Cap'n Assist trophy spawns in constantly, and this is a stamina battle. After tons of experimentation, I eventually found the ultimate strategy. Play so lame, Cap'n gets bored of curb stomping you and styles off the nearest building. Battle number 145, Sigma. I have no idea what happened here, but if anybody asks, tell them I did it on purpose. Battle number 152, Bomb Man. With two opponents to take down who are constantly barraging us with high damage explosives, Bomb Man looks like it's gonna be a difficult battle. Unless you think a little bit harder about Bomb Man's particular strategy. Say hello to Bomb Man's weakness in the rock, paper, scissors weakness triangle himself. Play as Fox, turn on his reflector, sit back, and drink a latte. Bomb Man is absolutely forced to spam bombs over and over no matter what we happen to be doing. With our reflector on, any thrown bombs will bounce off and potentially deal damage back to sender. Battle number 154, Gallium. 
Like Giga Bowser, Gallium is one of the easier bosses in World of Light. Every one of his attacks is slow with some big, obvious tells, and half of them aren't even capable of hitting us if we sit back and spam projectiles. This will still be a lengthy endurance match, but as long as you never make any ridiculously stupid mistakes, you'll be two-thirds of the way to opening the path to Galeen. Battle number 159, Donkey Kong. This marks one of the most important milestones in the entire playthrough. If I'd known what I was doing, I would have been playing as DK 10 hours ago. But despite the pleading of the Stram Chat, I refuse to believe Donkey Kong's game design could possibly contain a single flaw. The exact moment I actually tried using him, however, I realized, as always, that my entire life up to this point had been wasted. Battle number 164, Muddy Mole. Select Donkey Kong, tornado your opponent to a ledge, and that's it! You automatically win! Your opponent can't manually escape the tornado once caught inside, and if you edge guard with it, they'll constantly jump right back into you, effectively locking them in an infinite combo. Battle number 165, The Chorus Kids. DK Cheese is doubly useful on walk-off stages, especially one like this with multiple opponents. You can grab them in groups and carry them off in record time. And thanks to DK, I've finally gathered up the courage to challenge one of the hardest spirit battles in the entire game. The one spirit battle that single-handedly had me shaking in fear at the very concept of a Super Smash Bros. Ultimate challenge run. Battle number 166, Buzz Buzz. Ready? Go! Victory! I did it! I'm a Super Smash Bros. master! Battle number 167, Mario Mario Tennis Aces. As powerful as DK is, don't get your hopes up too high. Even with his incredible AI warping superpowers, you're still occasionally going to have to try. Mario Mario Tennis Aces is extremely high in power, meaning our incredibly low stats are even worse in comparison. On top of that, we have the infinitely respawning Pong Assist Trophy constantly bouncing us around. In addition to this cheese, we'll need a little extra help from dumb luck. Eventually, Peach flubbed a dodge and self-destructed. Mario has terrible recovery and is totally susceptible to edge guarding, so with just a bit more spam and a lucky Pong pattern, he got launched far enough to guarantee the KO. Battle number 168, Great Fairy. Great Fairy is another super strong spirit, and even worse, she has a great recovery move that prevents us from reliably edge guarding. While we can still rack up a little damage on her with Tornado Spam, it's never going to be enough for a bona fide launch. We're going to have to add a second move to Donkey Kong's moveset. After a little percentage is built up, knock Great Fairy off the stage, jump after her, and stomp down. Donkey Kong's Aerial Down A sends targets straight downward, and even if they're not at a high enough percentage for a launch, with enough distance they'll be incapable of recovering. Battle number 177, Affinity. As amazing as DK is, don't get so excited you start relying on him solo. Sometimes a character you might not expect could end up being a perfect choice. In this battle, I discovered Captain Falcon's Rapid Punch just so happened to be perfect for KOing each affinity when used at the end of the stage. If ever you run out of ideas, try showing your moves. Battle number 191, Peppy Hair. In this high power level battle, we have to fight three opponents simultaneously on one of the worst stages in the entire game, Venom. The downward slope on the wings makes DK Tornado spam much more difficult to pull off. I can only recommend spamming DK Tornado as much as possible and hoping the super aggressive AI decides to show you some mercy. Luckily, Peppy is the only required kill here, and keep in mind his extra midair jumps won't recharge until he touches the ledge or solid land. Get a few tornadoes on Peppy in a row and he'll be incapable of recovering. Battle number 193, Jody Summer. The trick here is to get kicked in the face, which I've personally discovered is a 100% valid strategy. Battle number 207, Honey Queen. While Honey Queen could theoretically be easily cheesed with Donkey Kong, it was at this point in the playthrough I got sick of the smell of cheese and decided, as I eventually decide every day of my life, to be bad at video games. Ready, go! <laughs> Why am I getting hit by a bee? How did that even happen? I was in the middle of comboing Pikachu. Where did the bee come from?
I am okay! Battle number 210, Latias and Latios. We've got two tough opponents to KO, and they always start the battle with a Pokemon so dangerous it's likely to build on tons of damage, if not KO us, instantly. But after about an hour of attempts, I discovered something extremely peculiar. If you hug the left edge of the stage, both opponents are highly likely to get bored and walk away. With some well-timed dodges, you'll win the battle without having to land a single attack. Battle number 212, Sakura Fire Emblem. Battle number 219. Who's the girl next door investigating the abandoned mansion? You better learn her name because it's Ashley Robbins. Not only does Ashley have good recovery, so does D, who is mostly invisible and also a required KO. You'll need to rack on tons of damage to launch both of them. I recommend focusing on Ashley first so you don't have any distractions while trying to keep track of D. Otherwise, just try to lock both of them into a ledge combo the same as usual. Battle number 233, Wallheart. Wallheart's super armor makes DK Tornado spam unfeasible. Bowser seems like a viable second choice since this is a walk-off stage, but Bowser isn't actually allowed to move in midair above certain types of ground, including the ground that makes up most of this stage. Rather than any special cheese, I ultimately sealed the deal with a chain of totally ordinary side throws, which aren't affected by super armor. Battle number 237, Eggplant Wizard. Get ready for an extremely tough challenge. Eggplant Wizard is decently high in power, has wonderful recovery, and worst of all, food is constantly spawning over the level. For you, that food does almost nothing, but for Eggplant Wizard, even a single morsel will reset a huge chunk of the damage you've dealt. You're gonna have to multitask, laying down the damage while grabbing nearby food to make sure he can't sneak a bite. When the stage transforms, you'll be closer to the edge of the screen, so if you manage to keep the percentage up, now's your chance to get the KO. Battle number 239, Medius. This battle serves as a great example for Inkling strengths. Since this is a stamina battle, tornado spam is a no-go. Inkling's bombs have the range to let us lay on lots of quick damage from afar, and they have the added bonus of knocking our opponent back with every hit. By keeping the spam up the whole match, I managed to win without getting hit a single time. Battle number 240, Squawks. What was that? Jesus! Alright, they're at 100. What? 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 Wait, what? <laughs> Battle number 241, Daruk. Thanks to the lava floor, most cheese options are out of the question. Eventually, I gave up on cheese and tried to do it legit as Link, which turns out to be a much easier strategy. His combination of ranged attacks and ridiculously useful bouncing stab let me rake on the damage just a little bit faster than Daruk could to me. Battle number 242, Volcanion. Yeah, the video will be... <laughs> the video will just be a grab bag of moments like that. I prepared the PowerPoint in advance. <laughs> Battle number 243, Metroid. This one is undoubtedly one of my favorite solutions found in the entire run. The constant interruptions from the Metroid void most strategies and make us take on tons of damage extremely quickly. But the Metroid can't actually kill us, and you might remember we've got one character who welcomes pain with an open fist. The Metroid allows Lucario to reach maximum aura safely, and has the added bonus of charging up his final smash in record time. We turn the tables and make the opponents assist trophy our own, double final smashing them into oblivion. Battle number 245, James McLeod. On a casual playthrough, James is one of the hardest spirit battles, and thanks to his choice of stage, he still puts up a decent fight in the spiritsless run. He takes near zero damage, gives near infinite, and has enough recovery to survive a mid-air stomp. We'll have to figure out a new strategy if we want to take James down, and by that I mean we're doubling down on the old one. Knock James off the stage, stomp him, and stomp him, getting a double stomp KO. Battle number 249, Flying Man. 
Welcome to one of the hardest, most time-consuming battles in the game. On paper, we only have two opponents, but notice Flying Man has five stocks. Even if we pull off a cheesy KO, he'll come back four more times. After a little bit of experimentation, though, we manage to find a workable strategy. The center platform can be jumped through from below, but can't be dropped through from above. If you position yourself on the small platform immediately below it, the AI will sometimes get confused and aimlessly wander around above you. Zero Suit Samus's upward smash attack is a long-range laser whip. Your opponents can't hurt you, but you can hurt them. Unfortunately, the AI isn't quite perfectly flawed and will inevitably figure out they can reach you by dropping off the ledge. Every time this happens, you've got two options. The first is jumping back to the stage proper, luring the AI to follow and hopefully setting up the cheese once again. The other is sending them back where they came from. After about three hours of attempts, I finally managed to quintuple kill Flying Man, who unfortunately will never find out where I was hiding during that 37th game of Hide and Seek. Battle number 250, Ness. Oh my god, I never considered that strategy! <laughs> battle number 254, Dr. Falco Ravioli. In this high wind stamina battle, I chose to fight Ravioli with Ravioli. Falco is decently capable of fighting the wind while running, and his side B in particular lets him close some distance while simultaneously attacking. Keep moving yourself to the left and looking for opportunities to rack on the damage. Ravioli is programmed to spam his blaster, which is difficult to hit with and barely has knockback. As long as you don't get hit while at the very right edge, you should be able to outstamina him and prove once and for all who's really the second best Nintendo bird. Battle number 265, Orbulon. This match begins with an extremely dangerous Starman Assist Trophy in play. To get rid of it ASAP, use Fox's Reflector to blast its own shots back. Once it's dead, Orbulon is weak enough you should be able to kill him no problem. Battle number 266, Bullet Bill. Ready? Oh my god, this is the best game ever made! This is beautiful! <laughs> battle number 271, King Hippo. This stamina battle is on a walk-off stage. You might think the cheese we'd use with other characters is viable, but King Hippo's knockback is so incredibly low, both DK and Bowser's cheese aren't good enough. Instead, we'll be altering the strategy with a new character, Lucas. Lucas has a long-range grab and long-distance back throw. Stand at the absolute edge of the play area, facing inward, wait for King Hippo to foolishly approach, then grab him and throw him backward for a super simple one-hit KO. Battle number 274, Sheldon. With four high-power, high-recovery opponents, this match is extremely difficult even with DK Tornado. Luckily, tons of weapons spawn in during the battle, including the Drill and Gust Bellows, which are both infamous for their cheesy KO potential. Blow your opponents off the stage with these to leave them flailing in frustration. Battle number 275, Medley. At first, this battle seemed ridiculously difficult until I discovered a little quirk. You can float in the water on the left side of the level indefinitely as long as you keep hopping above the water's surface. While down here, the AI will ruthlessly attempt to attack you, and every once in a while will totally flub their attempt and get run over by the ship. Just be patient for both Medley and Baloo to chase after you for a free victory. Battle number 276, Salamence. With this high wind, you'll have to play a game of keep away, running over and under the stage to keep Salamence at a distance and heaping on aura spheres whenever you get the opportunity. If everything lines up right, Salamence will have good damage when your final smash charges, allowing for a guaranteed KO. Battle number 282, Nikki. Doing a 1v3 with Nikki's constant swap note attacks is absolutely not gonna happen. Luckily, two of our three opponents have bad recovery and can be easily KO'd with Kirby's cheese. With the odds stacked slightly less against us, a 1v1 became feasible, and we kicked Me Gunner in the face for a well-earned victory. Battle number 294, Funky Kong. Fun fact that makes this battle 50 times easier than it first looks. Bullet Bills, despite literally being the attacking player, are legally projectiles and will be launched in the opposite direction by Fox's reflector. With proper positioning, our opponents will be bounced back, keeping us safe and hurtling them into each other. Credit for this discovery and victory goes to Zabruto or Dragonflame3030. I'm honestly not sure, the chat got really weird. Battle number 302, Lineback. Similar to Medley, the boat itself acts as an instant KO, but this time the water moves way too fast for us to safely go down there. 
Instead, just knock Link and Lineback down and they'll have no chance to recover. Battle number 307, Rick. The ice floor on this stage is incredibly annoying, but it thankfully doesn't extend to the very edge of the center platform. Plus, you're safe while standing on the blocks. Stick around that area and wait for your opponent to come to you, though do be careful if there's a live bomb nearby. Rick is thankfully not quite so wise. Battle number 317, Rathalos. Once again, Lucario is the best choice for this boss battle. My general strategy was to stick around Rathalos' tail, which acts as a safe spot. I had a tough time dodging when Rathalos went airborne, but luckily Deku Nuts and Pitfall Seeds spawned throughout the battle. Pitfall Seeds automatically stun Rathalos while airborne, and Deku Nuts automatically stun with a headshot. With a bit of luck, Rathalos stayed on the ground for the majority of the battle, and after about 10 minutes, I whittled down its health bar to zero. With the first three bosses dead, we are now allowed to challenge Master Hand and Galeem to finish the World of Light. But first battle number 318, Gutsman! I can't wait for him to just flop off the ledge and just die. You know, just trip. Because I feel like that's how this is going to end. <laughs> Ready? Go! By the way, exclamation mark pronouns. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> exclamation marks aren't a thing, but pronouns still are. Victory! I did it! <laughs> I told you! I told you what would happen and it happened! <laughs> Battle number 320, Master Hand. Thankfully, this is much easier than every prior boss fight. Almost all of Master Hand's attacks have obvious tells, and several aren't even capable of launching you, letting you charge up Lucario's aura and finish the battle with ludicrous damage. Battle number 321, Galeem. As always, Lucario is your best bet, and luckily most of Galeem's attacks are easy to dodge. For the electric balls, stand on the bottom platform, and right when the top orb starts to move, jump over it to the top. Phase 2 is the hard part, when Galeem will summon clones that stick around during the next attack. In these moments, I just drop down off a ledge and hoped for the best. Obviously, this isn't always going to work, so it's highly recommended you reach Phase 2 at 0% damage to let you take some hits. Once Aura gets charged up, the ledge strategy actually becomes even more viable, since you can drop down a lower distance and still survive. And, of course, you'll be dealing more damage to Galeem to help end the fight just a little bit sooner. With Galeem temporarily out of the picture, we head into the second half of the game, the World of Dark. We're leaving a decent chunk of spirits behind, but don't worry, we'll be back for them soon enough. Battle number 323, Gen. Is the Japanese version rare? Ready, go! So I've had the pleasant revelation. Victory! <laughs> Battle number 324, Crazy Hand. Though somewhat similar to Master Hand, this time more attacks are capable of a KO. Most attacks can be dodged by jumping off stage, as seen before. We can recover from basically any point below the stage once at high aura, so play it safe and stay down there until the coast is clear. The hands take damage much more quickly than other bosses, so this one shouldn't take you too long. Battle number 325, Raikou, Entei, and Suicune. At first, this battle appeared ridiculously difficult, until I discovered these legendary dogs are just as likely to flee as they were 20 years ago. Right at the beginning of the battle, Suicune did a quite frankly embarrassing self-destruct. Soon after, Entei apparently got curious what kind of party was happening down there, leaving Raikou cold and alone. Raikou thankfully has absolutely no idea how to play the game, constantly jumping down towards me in exactly the same way over and over again. Eventually, the cycle broke, and Raikou's face with it. Battle number 327, Octoling Girl and Octoling Boy. Both our opponents are extremely strong and have great recovery. Though not normally great on characters like this, after some experimentation, I decided Kirby Cheese was our best option. I'm not 100% sure what the deciding factor is, but if you get extremely lucky with the down slash and hit one of them in just the right way, they might be sent down far enough to fail to recover. After about 45 minutes of endless spam, I eventually got the ridiculous luck necessary to pull it off on both of them in one attempt. Battle number 329, Rock Volnut. This being a walk-off stage, the same strategy as usual applies. That said, it's not going to be as easy as usual, since there's a constant spawn of extremely annoying ranged items and our opponents tend to prefer to attack from afar. Even in my final successful attempt, I just happened to get extremely lucky getting launched into the safety of a launch barrel immediately before two rocks got hit by their weakness, a minecart. Afterward, the last rock was easy pickings. 
Battle number 330, Kray. Since this is a stamina match, and Kraid has some of the best recovery in the game, getting the ordinary cheesy KO is absolutely not happening. Nevertheless, DK Tornado is still the answer. Every time you knock Kraid off the stage, he'll use his recovery move to get back on it. And since he's doing his recovery move, he'll leave himself completely vulnerable, letting you do the same thing again. And again. And again. And again. And again. Using this quote-unquote strategy let me drain Kraid's HP to zero without taking a single point of damage. Battle number 333, The Imprisoned. I'm doing it. I'm killing The Imprisoned. I think I got this. Chat. You have to believe in me. Give me your power. I think we can do it. I think we can stop the imprisoned. I think we can seal them again. Believe in the power. We did it. Victory! Battle number 339, Woodman. As seen with Bomb Man, Fox's Reflector is all you need, though now you'll actually have to do your best to keep your distance since the leaves are only legally projectiles after they've been thrown. Battle number 340, Tiny Kong. In this battle, I didn't just accidentally stumble into dumb luck, I actually legitimately based my strategy on it. Get to the center platform and try to knock Tiny off the right edge. If the stars align, she'll randomly get yoinked into the abyss. Battle number 341, Rex. Since the arena has a fiery floor, ledge shenanigans are our only option, and since this is a stamina match, we've got a limited time to pull them off. Keep in mind, you're only allowed to grab ledges up to seven times before having to recharge by touching the ground. Thankfully, neither of our opponents have great recovery, so landing the spike is a near-guaranteed KO. Battle number 343, Mr. L. Victory! I did it! I don't know what I did, but I did it! Battle number 358, Krom. Ready? Go! Battle number 363, Calamity Ganon. Krom, similar to Kirby, can use his Soaring Slash near a ledge for exactly the same cheese. But unlike Kirby, Krom's up B will send opponents hurtling downward at ridiculous speed, absolutely guaranteeing the KO against almost any opponent capable of receiving knockback. This time, they don't even get the chance to recover. Battle number 373, Urbosa. Even stamina battles are no problem. We don't need to build knockback. This strategy still works even at 0%. And even if you don't manage the ledge grab, there's still a decent chance your opponent will hit the blast zone first, making you the legal victor. Battle number 366, Mega Mewtwo Y. To put it bluntly, Krom is the win button, and we'll be replacing Donkey Kong as our most used character from this point forward. May every remaining being in the Smash universe flee in terror. And I've got even more good news. Battle number 361, Young Link. Five words. Young Link is my main. Battle number 364, Metagross. Since this is a stamina battle against a metal opponent, Chrom Cheese won't work here, but it also happens to be the perfect opportunity to show off Young Link's strengths. He's super agile and specializes in ranged attacks. Play Keep Away with Metagross and rack up the damage from afar, running to the opposite edge of the arena as necessary. Metagross has some ranged attacks too, which will make this one extremely difficult either way, but in the shoes of Young Link, I was right at home. Battle number 382, Ganon. Bet you didn't expect to see Zelda here, and honestly, neither did I. I was having difficulty fighting Ganon with Lucario. Since Ganon can only be damaged by hitting his tail, most characters need to get behind him to get any hits in. Zelda is a rare exception since Din's fire travels straight through him, letting you keep your distance for the majority of the battle. We'll probably never use Zelda again, but for this single battle, she was easily one of the best options. Battle number 385, Crazy Hand 2. We'll have to fight Crazy Hand several times throughout the World of Dark. This time, I brought in Young Link. 
The combination of his ranged attacks and my actually knowing how to play as him makes Young Link a great boss killer. Battle number 390, Meta Knights. As delicious as Krom's cheese is, I don't recommend you have too much in one sitting. There's a constant risk of flubbing downward to your death. In large battles, I recommend using it to thin the crowd, then shifting to safer casual strats. Battle number 392, Omega Ridley. I, yes, I did it! Battle number 394, Quick Man. Okay, we good. I did it. It was a long, grueling endurance battle, but managed to come out on top. <laughs> battle number 395, Gray Fox. Shadow Moses is probably the worst possible stage for all our cheese options. It's technically a walk-off stage, ruling out crom cheese, but is also walled in, ruling out walk-off cheese until the extremely sturdy walls break. Against Gray Fox here, I worked around these limitations by using DK to rack up damage, then dealing the fatal blow with DK's final smash, which always launches opponents upward. Battle number 397, Houndoom. I did it! I found the strat! Battle number 421, Akuma. Ready? Go! Wow! <laughs> Beautiful! Battle number 426, Dracula. Without any doubt, Dracula is the hardest boss we've seen yet. It took tons of experimentation with tons of characters, but eventually I gave in to the Strem Chat's incessant demands and switched to their top pick, Ness. He immediately died because he sucks and is bad. Instead, we're bringing in Young Link, whose combination of small form factor, high speed, and ranged attacks made him perfect for both vanilla and transform Dracula. The transformation is easily the most dangerous section of the fight. Keep it a long range and get ready to dodge to the opposite side at any given moment. Play it safe and eventually you'll take one more boss down. Battle number 428, Axel. Though not explicitly forced to use ranged attacks, Axel can still be skillfully cheesed with Fox's Reflector. Remember, your opponent's attacks are way more powerful than your own. Let go of the Reflector to bait your opponents into shooting you, then immediately turn it back on and watch as they punch themselves in the face. Battle number 438, Rosalina and Luma. Go back! I felt okay again. Battle number 447, and draw Star Fox 64 3D. Ready? Go! <laughs> Andros saved me! Andros beat Andros for me! Battle number 451, off the hook. Framing device aside, we're technically not showing off the battle this time. Instead, we're showing something totally unrelated to the run that I nevertheless found interesting. In the Japanese quiz show, we're asked which set of characters have a senpai kohai relationship. This would roughly be the equivalent of a senior-junior relationship. Rather than making any attempt to localize this difficult, nuanced question requiring knowledge of the characters, the English localization team instead flips the table over and scribbles over the original question in Cram. Which of these characters are from Splatoon? Golly gee whiz! I wonder if the Splatoon characters might be from Splatoon! Battle number 453, Ike. Though not quite as big a game changer as Krom, Ike is fully capable of the same cheese technique and honestly my preferred character between the 
Cantu. Battle number 454, Regigigas. Ike is a much slower character than Krom, and this translates to his recovery cheese. While Krom's cheese is easier to use properly while grabbing the ledge for safety, Ike's cheese works better with intentional self-destruction. Battle number 464, Marks. For this third World of Dark boss battle, I once again brought in Young Link. Thankfully, Marx is the easiest of the main three in the World of Dark. While he's got some attacks that are difficult to dodge, most aren't, and the battle is short enough you can seal the deal with just a little bit of luck. Battle number 465, Wispy Woods. Welcome to what I personally believe is the absolute hardest spiritless battle in the entire game. We've got five total opponents to KO, are always fighting two to three simultaneously, are under the effects of ridiculously high wind, and the shape of the stage makes it impossible for almost every character in the game to reliably move back since we're forced to go airborne. None of my prior cheese had any effect at all, requiring a little help from the stream chat to find a totally new, highly specific strategy with a totally new character, Ganondorf. At the exact moment the battle begins, jump to the left platform, face left, and charge up a leftward smash attack. Keep spamming these smash attacks as long as it's safe to do so. When your opponents get too close, switch to spamming the Warlock Punch. While the punch is charging, you gain super armor, preventing your opponents from interrupting it. As the fight goes on, your opponents will inevitably eventually hit you. Try to land as close to the left of the screen as possible, and always face to the left. Just keep spamming smash attacks and warlock punches, and eventually, through sheer RNG, you'll get the perfect match where all five Kirbys walk directly into your fist. Battle number 470, Maruhige Shop Owner. <laughs> Battle number 481, Adam Malkovic. Victory! Battle number 488, Alencia. Battle number 496, Master Giant. Master Giant is ridiculously powerful and has super armor, necessitating a personalized strategy. Play as Kirby and hover just below the arena away from the ledge. After waiting a while, hopefully Master Giant will get annoyed and try to jump towards you. Mash the jump button to perform a footstool, after which he'll hopefully be incapable of recovering. Battle number 497, Ancient Minister. This battle can be extremely difficult, but only if it lasts longer than a couple seconds. The arena starts as a walk-off stage before lifting up into the air. Rush straight towards the robs with DK, do a tornado, and hope you grab all four of them simultaneously. Battle number 501, Sheeta. Sheeta is easily another of the hardest spirits in the game thanks to her combination of Ultra Heavy Wind and the requirement that both opponents be KO'd. Thanks to the arena shape, Ganondorf essentially dies in one hit, making his shenanigans even less reliable than before. After experimenting with several characters, I finally quote-unquote found a quote-unquote strategy. A theory I've thought of for the Zelda timeline, only Breath of the Wild, Age of Calamity, and Breath of the Wild 2 are can- OH MY GOD! <laughs> oh my god, the double stomp! <laughs> that is going in the video! Battle number 508, Yarn Yoshi. Crom cheese doesn't work here due to the ridiculous low gravity. Instead, we use reverse Crom cheese. If you hit a Yoshi with Crom soaring slash while near the top of the screen, they'll be catapulted up so high they escape the second half of the attack and Earth's atmosphere. Battle number 510, Rover. Since we can't perform Crom cheese or abuse the walk-off area, this is the perfect opportunity to abuse Ike's personal Aether-flavored cheese alternative. Aether is a ridiculously overpowered move that the AI has difficulty dodging, and since there's no ledge to grab, they'll be forced to run straight into it while trying to recover. Give them as many servings of Aether as it takes for them to finally ask for a box. Battle number 512, Ashley. Yet another of the hardest spirit battles in the game. It's difficult to tell just by watching, but over the course of the match, the player's controls are constantly reversing, meaning left is right and right is left. 
Since Chrome Tease requires precise horizontal movement, you're gonna have to rewire your brain on demand. Battle number 516, Pauline. Though regarded as one of the hardest spirit battles in the game, in a spiritsless run, she's actually one of the easy ones. Chase her down, hit her with one of Ike's Aethers, and fall into the abyss. Battle number 524, Dr. Wawi. This is a highly dangerous stamina battle against nine total opponents, eight of which specialize in ranged attacks that can hit you basically anywhere. Your Chrom Cheese is gonna have to be perfectly on point. Remember, you can only grab a ledge seven times in sequence, so occasionally you'll have to brave solid ground to recharge. Unfortunately, these opponents are also hesitant to come after you. If the chance presents itself and there's only one opponent around, you can switch to trying to drain their stamina. Perform a Soaring Slash, move backwards to safety, then run back to your opponent to repeat the process. This is gonna be a tough one, so be prepared for hours of pain and suffering. Once Dr. Wawi himself shows his face, the hard part is over. You're just one more step away from everlasting peace. Battle number 525, Metal Gear Rex. Play as Lucas, trick both Rexes to destroy the wall for you, run to the edge of the screen, duck under the sub-missiles, and pray both of them are stupid enough to get close enough for a back throw. Battle number 526, Snake. I was actually just punching Snake in the face for fun until accidentally witnessing something awesome. Snake flubbed his input and got himself stuck under the stage, but the AI is smart enough to know your recovery move recharges when you take damage, so he dropped a C4 and blew himself up. Unfortunately, he failed to stick the landing, performing the same trick multiple times in a row before finally missing himself with the C4. This is very likely the most impressive self-destruct I have ever witnessed. Battle number 527, 9 volt and 18V. The assist trophy makes even Chrom Cheese a highly dangerous strategy, but I happened to get super lucky and dragged both 9 volt and 18 volt into the abyss simultaneously. Battle number 528, Dr. Wright. Rockman has super armor, but luckily Dr. Wright is the only required KO. Chase him down and aether him away from the stage, dragging him down to finish him off. Battle number 532, Slippy Toe. Battle number 536, Mr. Sandman. Though technically a walk-off stage, the ground here is sleep-inducing, meaning DK Tornado and Lucas Cheese aren't an option. Instead, I improvise with Young Link, waiting for Sandman to follow me to the edge of the screen before dragging him off with an aerial spin attack. Battle number 546, Ryu. If you want a challenge, 3DS Cruel Smash. Who are you talking to? I don't want a challenge. I hate challenge. Exclamation mark, can you beat? See? This game is more my level of difficulty. What? I wasn't even looking at the screen for half the match. <laughs> you think you're good at Street Fighter? I can beat it with my eyes closed. Battle number 547, Emperor Bullblax. This highly difficult, super armored, high recovery stamina battle necessitated a new strategy. Hence why we're bringing in a new character, Black Pit, who just so happens to have all the attributes on my checklist. His arrows let us get in some damage from afar. His excellent recovery allows us not only to hide under the stage, but to fly clean under the entire thing, giving us maximum distance from the Emperor. Finally, his guardian orbiters can reflect the Emperor's cannonballs right back into his ugly mug dealing way higher damage than we're normally capable of. This will be an intense endurance battle, and if you pull it off, an incredibly satisfying victory. Battle number 548, Zelda Breath of the Wild. The battle begins with four highly dangerous opponents. Feline directly for Daruk for the cheesy KO, otherwise he'll constantly be spawning tornadoes while everybody else gangs up on you. From there, you'll just need to pull off four more successful Chrom Cheeses. At this point, I finally completed every single spirit battle in the World of Light and World of Dark. It's finally time to earn the right to enter the end game. Battle number 560, Dars. Though structurally similar to the Galeem fight with some similar attacks, he's also got some totally new ones. Since the bombs explode at diagonal angles, they're much harder to keep track of than their counterparts. You'll need to get super good at hanging off the edge of the stage to dodge attacks. Plus, I personally finally learned how good Lucario's counterattacks are against bosses. And by the way, fun fact that will come in super useful for every boss fight from this point on. 
If your shield breaks, the higher your percentage, the lower the time you're stunned. If you're close to death, you recover almost immediately. If you get trapped in a corner, intentionally breaking your shield is a valid survival strat. In the second phase, you'll once again have to deal with simultaneous attacks from both clones and Dars. How easy these are to survive is pure RNG. Don't blame yourself if you get absolutely slaughtered. With a ton of luck and a ton of skill, you should eventually be able to finish Dars off, unlocking the final map, the War Zone. Battle number 573, Eve. Though not technically a walk-off stage, moving platforms move off the side of the screen right at the beginning of the battle. Lure Eve over with Lucas for a cheesy back throw. Battle number 574, Roy. I had to. I'm sorry. Battle number 586, Master Hand 3. This is the final battle against Master Hand, featuring his complete moveset. This time, I brought back my favorite boss killer, Lucario. When Master Hand sends out fireballs from the back of the screen, walk around the left side of the stage and duck down. If properly positioned, every fireball will completely miss you. For any direct physical attacks with an early tell, counterattacks are the easiest dodge method and also happen to deal some free damage. When Master Hand starts to follow you around, drop below the arena. Whatever attack he might be going for, this will allow for an easy dodge. Jumping off stage is also the safest strategy I found for the bouncing spike balls. Every other attack you should be able to dodge just by reacting in the moment, eventually permanently eliminating Master Hand from the boss roster. Battle number 593, Takumi. Say hello to another of the hardest battles in the entire game, once again featuring our old friend Heavy Wind. The wind is so ridiculous this time, even the footstool strat isn't gonna cut it. Instead, we once again used an entirely new strategy featuring an entirely new character, Pokemon Trainer. Squirtle's Withdraw is capable of fighting the wind and protects us from Takumi's arrow attacks. Keep spamming Withdraw back and forth and just pray Takumi is stupid enough to stand in the way. Even if you go over the edge, Waterfall is able to fight the wind and lift you back up. Since Takumi focuses on firing arrows, it takes a while before your own percentage is high enough for a killing launch. So even though this strategy takes forever, you've still got a decent chance. When your final smash finally charges up, aim it carefully to guarantee the KO. Battle number 594, Arceus. The exact moment Arceus stomps the ground, you'll be meteor smashed into oblivion. You'll have to pray your opponent runs over to help you speed run before that happens. Battle number 599, Magnus. Since Magnus has super armor, cheese is out of the question, so I brought back Black Pit for the same strategy as seen against Emperor Bullblax. Since Magnus doesn't have ranged attacks, this is a lot easier than the last time. Eventually, your arrows will become capable of launch, and with a well-timed shot, it will be impossible for Magnus to recover. Battle number 607, Claws. <laughs> You've been asleep for 10 years, Alucard. Wake up! Your family loves you! I did it. Battle number 613, Bayonetta. Come on! 55%! 56.5%! Bustin' Wolf! No Bustin' Wolf! At the edge of the stage, even! Bayonetta, what kind of defense you got? What? I like Super Smash Brothers Ultimate for the Nintendo Switch. Battle number 614, Crazy Hand 5. 
This is the final Crazy Hand battle rivaling the Briar Master Hand, once again featuring Crazy Hand's full moveset. Much of your strategy will be the same as the one against Master Hand, including the counterattacks on everything with an obvious tell, and jumping off the stage to dodge particularly difficult attacks. This includes the spinning fireballs, which you'll only have to worry about when they fly straight off screen. There's no way to avoid the eyeball stare, so you'll just have to get used to a well-timed dodge to invulnerability frame your way through it. Once you've memorized all his attacks, you have no excuse for taking damage and should be fully capable of winning the battle. Bidding farewell to Crazy Hand for good. Battle number 615, Cloud 2. <laughs> Come on, come down here and get me. Come on, Cloud. You got this. Come on, I know you've got decent enough recovery. You could totally. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, come on. Come on, Cloud. I'm making it easy for you. Making it easy for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Look, I got my back to you. I'm wide open. Come on. Come on. What are you doing? Get over here. Get over here. Get yeah. Get get over here. Get over here. Come on. Come on. I think Master Hand might need a, need a nerf. So, how's it going, everybody? My morning's been fine. I have been working on... I was actually doing work work. I was not being lazy this morning. Uh, I've been working on a... Uh, I'm gonna make a no commentary video. Just compiling every single spirit battle in this entire playthrough. Uh, only the successful attempts. This is gonna be all one gigantic video that goes on the No Commentary channel. I've got about two hours of footage on it. It's about uh, 100 fights so far. What is happening? I just tuned in. Uh, I'm trying to beat the cloud fight. Yeah, how was everybody else's morning? Remember when I said I was going to go play Melody of Memory? Becca called me the moment the stream ended, so I didn't play Melody of Memory. I was debating just playing it all day today, but... Nah. <laughs> I can't leave Smash unfinished. It's my fatal character flaw. Oh wait, you're controlling Mr. <laughs> What, did you come in here and think I was doing the boss fight playing as Dark Cloud? <laughs> and this is what the AI gave me? <laughs> Just finished work. Congratulations, Karama. Why are you bullying poor Cloud? I'm more of an Alto Stratus fan myself. Okay, wake up. Boop. 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 There you go. And... Oh. Boop. Thank you for the 100 bits, chat. <laughs> Congratulations! You've now cleared out every single possible battle from the World of Light, World of Dark, and Warzone, leaving only the three separate final boss battles. You can technically get an ending by fighting any of the three, but remember, this is a 100% run. Be prepared, these final boss battles are so hard, they'll likely take you multiple days of attempts each. Battle number 616, Galeem 2. To start the battle off, intentionally get hit by the laser attack for ridiculous high damage. I swear I can explain. 
Phase 2 of the battle is incredibly difficult and a bad pattern can essentially kill us instantly from 0%, but Phase 1 is comparatively easy. Taking damage immediately means Lucario will be powered up by Aura and deal way more damage, getting us to Phase 2 and thus beginning the actual attempt as fast as possible. The Raining Wings are easy enough to dodge you can likely get in some damage during, but if you're apprehensive, they'll never spawn off stage, so you're safe there. The bombs are always at easily readable angles. I recommend just eliminating the one at ground level to ensure your safety. When the Electric Balls show up, stand halfway to the side facing center. Jump over the first ball, then over again, luring all the balls away from the stage so you can run under them when they chase a second time. For the screen covering lasers, just ignore where the lasers are actually located and air dodge through both sets. For the fireball volley, drop below the opposite ledge. You're completely safe there. For the explosive ball, stand just below as it's fired, then run to the opposite side of the stage. For the light clones, drop below the stage and keep as far away as possible. Remember, if they're crowding you, you can switch sides. The parabola waves aren't capable of launching you, but damage is damage, so you'll just have to improvise based on the pattern. Finally, the absolute worst attack in the entire game, the taboo-style Rings of Light. There are always four of these in a row, and since we're already at high percent, a single hit is a guaranteed KO. Where they spawn is determined by RNG, so you'll always have to improvise. If they're approaching horizontally, dodge through them. If they start approaching vertically, run off the opposite side of the stage and stall until they despawn. To give yourself the maximum amount of stall time, perform a counterattack in midair to reset your vertical speed. If you wait until the last possible second, you might have just enough time to aura launch yourself back onto the stage after the final ring dissipates. With Mario's brutally depressing on-screen death, we achieve the first bad ending and move on to earn the second. Battle number 617, Dars 2. Similar to Galeem, I intentionally take damage immediately to build up aura and speed our way into phase two. Against the teleporting tentacles, I recommend staying on the top platform. In my personal experience, you can safely dodge from all possible directions by jumping upward. Against the arena covering tentacle slashes, stand in the center and perform a counterattack. Keep in mind, this attack leaves behind a Terran reality that doesn't damage you, but slows you down during the next attack. You'll probably have to improvise a bit to avoid it. When Dar snakes around the screen, you're completely safe below the stage, but keep an eye out for any safe opportunities to jump up and deal some damage. The Diagonal Bombs are one of the most dangerous attacks. Get rid of whichever ones are closest to you, and if you aren't certain you're safe, move to the side of the stage. The Dark Pillars are always summoned directly below you, so with smart movement you can weave between them while banking some damage. Worst case scenario, you're mostly safe off stage and can wait there. Against the gun attack, always move off the side of the stage. You'll be mostly safe there, though remember to drop down to avoid the explosion. The tentacle spikes are the equivalent of Galeem's ring attack and are thankfully way easier to dodge. Stand roughly center stage and down dodge on time with each tentacle. Keep in mind, the timing is slightly different depending on the distance. Of course, Stars is also capable of summoning clones just like Galeem, at which point you'll have to employ the same solution of flailing your arms in terror while screaming below the stage. Ultimately, Dars 2 is an easier battle than Galeem 2, taking me only three days to complete. With literally every single video game character that has ever or will ever exist thoroughly eradicated two times over, there's only one battle left. And wouldn't you know it, it's the hardest battle in the entire game. This one's so ridiculously long, a single attempt will likely take multiple days to complete. Welcome to the final battle, Kaleem and Dars. There are three separate sections of the battle with two checkpoints in between. Even if you die, you can continue from the beginning of the current section with all fighters at 0% as long as you never explicitly quit the battle or end the game. And even better, upon loss, there's no penalty for swapping characters, so you're free to experiment and use whoever is most appropriate for the current checkpoint. Since the first section is an easy platforming warm-up, I brought in three characters just for the symbolism points. Donkey Kong, Ike, and Terry. Additionally, since this section is so easy, don't worry about closing Smash to play another game. You can get back to the second section in about 10 minutes. Said second section, though, is a nightmare. It's a boss rush featuring six bosses returning from the World of Light and World of Dark in a row. I recommend assigning two bosses to each character you choose, based on their strengths and weaknesses. Lucario is the best character in the lineup, capable of fighting every boss. I put him in the front, with his assigned bosses being Rathalos and Ganon. Next is Young Link. He's less versatile, but has a better arsenal of ranged attacks. His assigned bosses are Dracula and Giga Bowser. Finally, Inkling has excellent versatility, aerial attacks, and a long-distance splat bomb. 
Their assigned bosses are Marks and Gallium. We chose these bosses in order to get the hardest bosses out of the way ASAP, while accounting for potential matchups if we go ahead of or behind schedule. That said, always be ready to improvise and change up the plan. Though our actual plan was to go against the hardest boss, Rathalos, first, I eventually over-practiced Rathalos to the point I was having a harder time on Dracula, and swapped Dracula into Lucario's front slot to get more practice. Considering how long this battle is, you probably don't need the reminder to absolutely never take damage if you can help it. We die in two to three hits, and since we've got three characters to take on six bosses, the math on that isn't very pretty. When fighting vanilla Dracula, only his head can take damage. With Lucario's moveset, your best damage dealer will be an aerial back A. When Dracula arrives from a teleport, you always have time to get in one attack provided he spawned close to you. Otherwise, keep away. The only major attack to worry about is the spinning orbs. Position yourself just slightly to the side of where they pass by and you'll be safe. If they happen to be combined with any other attack, though, the best possible strategy is getting pinballed around painfully and horribly. In Phase 3, Dracula becomes an instant KO monster at close range, so only attack from afar, no exceptions. Keep in mind, many of his attacks get upgraded and harder to dodge without warning in Phase 4, roughly at his health bar's halfway point, so keep an eye on that health bar and be ready for the shift. When he jumps for you, react with a very quick hop and side dodge in his direction. When he fires homing orbs, stand still, wait for the first orb to fire, then jump over and dodge down through the volley. The Lightning Blast is super easy to jump over, but remember the timing is slightly earlier in Phase 4. The attack I had the most trouble dodging is the Fireball Volley. In Phase 4, these sprout Flame Pillars on contact with the ground. Stand still, jump into the air, and move slightly forward. With Dracula dead, we go back on schedule to Lucario's first assigned boss, Rathalos. By this point, I'd learned that sticking by Rathalos' tail is far too dangerous. Instead, focus on spamming ranged attacks. During the battle, always be on the lookout for fireballs. They can come in either single doses or volleys of three. For the triple volley, jump above the first one, then dodge under the second and third. When Rathalos roars while grounded, it will either take off for a background attack or go into a charge. For the charge, do a counterattack in the opposite direction, then get ready for up to two more counters in succession. For the background fireball, stick to center stage and jump slightly to the side just as the first fireball is being launched. These fireballs are always evenly spaced, so this will be a guaranteed safe zone. By the way, remember in the first battle when I said Rathalos was the most dangerous in the air? Turns out, after tons of practice, I eventually discovered an airborne Rathalos is actually preferable. Similar to while grounded, Rathalos will only attempt an attack while facing you. Hug close and Rathalos will be forced to constantly retreat while you rack up some free damage. That said, don't hang too close in case Rathalos roars, and be ready to counter at a moment's notice. Finally, don't bother saving the Deku Nuts and Pitfall Seeds. Use them to stun Rathalos ASAP for some free, easy damage. With your Rathalos bagged, we head into boss number three, Ganon. Since you can only damage Ganon's tail, you'll have to get creative. Pay attention for the few moments when his tail reverses aside so you can hit it with a ranged attack. Additionally, with Lucario's extreme speed, you can travel straight through Ganon to the other side. The absolute most dangerous attack in Ganon's arsenal is his off-screen Ground Pound, which also happens to be the main reason he's assigned to Lucario. Another character should do an upward air dodge, but Lucario has the extra safety of a counterattack. For the explosive ball, stand close to Ganon, wait a little, then run off so the ball explodes on the ground behind you. Similar to Dracula, keep an eye on the health bar and be prepared for Ganon's shift to Phase 2, which is usually signaled by his mouth laser. In this phase, the electric swings occur twice in a row, so stay up in the air a little longer than usual. Once Ganon fell, I was officially ahead of schedule, heading for the hardest remaining boss to take advantage of Lucario's aura, Marks. Marks loves to wander around the entire screen, so almost all damage will be dealt with aerial attacks. Be prepared when Marks is near the top of the screen so as not to get hit by his cutter attack. When his shadow appears on the ground, he'll rubber band when moving past you. Abuse that by reversing directions and be ready to guard if he comes out with bad timing. Similarly, you can rubber band Marks as he prepares to spit ice at you, making for an easier dodge. When he plants seeds, run for the edge of the arena. Usually, the seeds won't fall there, though do be prepared for the possibility. When Marks drops his eyeballs on you, duck down slightly to his side. How safe this is and the exact position to stand depend on Marks' height, but most of the time, they'll bounce over you until eventually getting bored and bouncing away. For the spreading veins, I walk slightly off screen and spam the shield button. 
I hesitate to call this a strategy, but it sort of kind of worked, so I don't care. For the spinning lasers, I never found a consistent dodge method, but since I was at high percent, I didn't need one, letting my shield break, which just so happened to keep me invulnerable long enough to survive. With Mark's dead, we've only got two lightweights left, starting with boss number five, Giga Bowser. We've got a lot riding on this thing, so even though he's easy, play it absolutely safe. Case in point, halfway through, I failed to heed my own advice and got Lucario slaughtered, swapping in Young Link. Let Bowser approach you and wait for the tell on his next attack, jumping over him and maybe getting some damage in on the retreat. Unfortunately, I messed up royally and sent Young Link flying into the stratosphere to join Lucario, leaving me with my last life, Inkling. The same general strategy applies, but thankfully Inkling is more versatile in the air and thus can dodge more safely. Once you take Giga Bowser down, you've only got one boss left in the rush, Gallium. While Gallium is the easiest boss, we already saw just how dangerous the second easiest boss is, so do not take any risks whatsoever. Deal absolutely all damage from the far side of the stage. As Inkling, as long as you throw your bombs in midair, they should be able to reach. Whenever he makes a move, be prepared to jump up for one of the top corners of the screen. These are usually the safe spot for all his ranged attacks. When he starts hovering, run under him to the opposite side of the screen. For the spin attack, run in the opposite direction to fight the wind. Finally, watch out for when Gallium goes off screen in vehicle mode. In phase two, he sometimes follows this up with a ground pound. You can tell when he's about to fall based on his shadow popping in. He never falls on the screen's edge, but if he can't make it that far, you'll have to do a quick hop and dodge. Once you deal the final blow to Gallium, the boss rush is officially over, and with it, the hardest moment of the entire playthrough as you bank the final checkpoint. Gaming godliness like this only comes once per lifetime, so absolutely do not turn Smash off until you seal the deal against the final boss of the final boss battle, Galeem and Dars. Once again, you have the opportunity to swap your fighter. I'm personally keeping the characters the same, but swapping the order around so our toughest contender, Lucario, spawns in during Phase 2 when we need him the most. The thought of fighting two bosses simultaneously might have you preemptively scheduling a demolition date for your Switch, but it's not as bad as it sounds on paper. To compensate for the extra complexity, both bosses hold themselves back, using simpler versions of all their attacks, including the Phase 2 super moves. The same general strategy applies to dodging everything, though you'll probably have to resort to flailing and terror a lot more often. Often. The clones are actually ten times easier to dodge now since they're usually focused on murdering each other. As for dealing damage, I've got even more good news. Galeem and Dars aren't exactly on speaking terms and are just as motivated to murder each other as you are them. And since they're not doing a spiritsless run, they'll be dealing unfathomable damage. Even so, your own attacks add up over time, so don't let up. Focus on attacking whichever of the two currently has the most health. Once one boss dies, the other will stop holding back, reverting to the attack patterns seen in their solo battles. Execute Galeem first, so you won't have to deal with the full power Rings of Light, instead being left with Dars's comparatively simple tentacle jabs. This isn't gonna be easy, but if you made it this far, we both know how it's gonna end. After 149 hours, 26 minutes and 31 seconds game time, 8 months real time, and 2 root canals, the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate Spiritsless Skillless 100% Run is officially an ultimate mission complete! If you'd like to see the original run, I've got two options for you. The first is the livestream archives on the Let's Stream channel, on which you can watch the playthrough in its unabridged entirety. The second is the demonstration on my No Commentary channel, which features only the successful attempts of every battle, and has a companion spreadsheet to help find any specific battle you're interested in. I also have a word from today's special guest. Who's that voice you heard about an hour ago? You better learn my name because it's Wario Fan. 
If you're curious about some of the spirits you saw in this video, come check out my channel and watch Nin Chronicles. It's a show where I cover Nintendo's entire gaming catalog. I just launched a video on Kirby Air Ride. And if you're a fan of Game Champ, she shows up sometimes too. Wait, hold on, is that my percentage bar? <laughs> Special thanks to all Patreon backers, including all the bugs Yugi has killed, Andrew Seibert, Anon42, RB Drock, Solin Zero, Les Lamb, Chris Nate, Alexander Botkin, Anu Akrira, David Tony Covers, Vincent Hall, Alex Nelson, Lively Leader, The Quacky Gamer, Luminescent Dragon, Jace Nilges, Vaxoid, Praetor, Faith, Rory Kelly, Lane Robert Leishman, Liddy Kitty, Jace Harsh, Crustacean Creep, Queen Sapphire, Plum Sweater, Epic Evan 921, Alex Likes to Eat, Yield Foreign, Ace of Hearts, Rundum Goy, Misfunctional, Cam the Can One, Nathaniel Kalita, Alistair Echoes, The Duck Walked Up to the Lemonade Stand, etc. Zo, Multicore, Aaron Bailey, The Green Scorpion, Game Champ says trans rights are human rights, Procrastinating Destiny, Xander Kozak, Celestial Cookie, 8-Bit Mistrevis, Boom Boxy, John Miller, Curbs D50, Jorb, KK, Damien R, Yap Alonzo, Wave It, Platypu 115, World's Slowest Game of Chess, Waiting for Black to Move, Star Captain Eli Shaba of Clan Ghost Bear, Toro 25, Blue Moon Von Idaho, Britface, The Nonchalant Nacho, Bragger Jester, Very Gucci, Wispy Syrup, Riley Anderson, Arcomb, Samptunian Baby, Chronosanthium, Kid, Salty Sweet, Slowest Game of Chess, Guess I'm Black Then, 1 E4 E4. Six for the French defense. Officer Slard, what's that noise? Uh, her name is Game Bad at Video Games but beat Pokemon without getting hit, Champ Sam. Nova, Sinique says hashtag land back, Sulfuric Boss, Fabi, Zith Agle, Sand Dragon, Eric Baron, Zero, Mars Becker, Fyra, Shadowfire 638, Silktoid, Ivy Mackey. Drawn by AJ2, the return of the Ha Ha Funny Meme Name. Amphison, Greg Campbell, Nikki Wiki 34, Admiral Ampersand. Literal Cat, Sylvie Wing Cat Girl is gay and doesn't go to bed on time. Reblog if you too are gay and or don't go to bed on time. AB Cable, Ali Shaw, it's Flip Chicken, Matthew. Matthew Elliott, Handy Capable, Sound of Rain, Ryan Garvey, Milk Succubus, Arcade, Grand Nero, How Much Could, Woulda Could Chuck Chuck, The Could Chuck, Would Chuck Good. Wadashi Can't Believe Game of Champions Hand Can Beat Day Rantu Sumashu Barazazu, Soup Sheru Toma Shibi no Hashi, But Can't Say It Correctly. Redacted, Fireblade974, Literally Judas, Now I Only Want to Triumph, Norahana, Do I Have a Funny Haha -ha Meme Name Yet? We're All About Love, Peace, and Chicken Grease in Izumo. According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way a bee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small to get its fat lit. Bee Me Animates, Charles Cusser Agorad. The Insane One. Nathan Riddle, Maria, Noah Webster, Sorio99, Jack Silverson, Dakota Riggs. It is generally accepted that Velociraptor had feathers and may have even had wings. Soglob, Phantom Phoenix, Infamous Peace, Miles Edgelord, Trish Chandler, Airtide, Mackenzie, Trees, Bees are the Knees, Lily Sap, Eleven, Sin Parks, Colin Monsma, Darkness, Zebras, Tea Coffee, Champ Doesn't Like to Say Funzy Runzy, Lidak. Please stop making such long names. I have sworn never to breathe in until the list of Patreon backers is finished and I need ox Carlo Calcetera, Brizgy, Dr. Feed, Eli Katniss 1818, NB Ellie Blue, Colin Vidar, the $5 once guy, Margaret Josephine, and Brandon Weller. Let me know how much this video sucks and how to improve in the comments below. Yes, there are actually 618 battles, not 615, I don't know why exactly, but suspect some of the crazy hand battles aren't officially counted and get out of my house.